Before I met Prabhupada, I was kind of a searcher. I was looking for something sort of spiritual, but I didn't know what it was. I was reading many books of, of, of Buddhism and Hinduism, but I still was a little unsatisfied. I, I didn't know what I was looking for. And when I heard that Prabhupada was giving a lecture, that he was an old Swami who was lecturing nearby where I lived, I thought I would go along and, and have a look. I think I was a bit of a searcher all my life. And I did find that in my Jewish background, a lot of hypocrisy, there was hypocrisy in the rabbis, there, were, there was hypocrisy in the services. I was, in a way, kind of looking for something that was devoid of hypocrisy. I was looking for something that was spiritual. I was looking for something that was devoid of, of faults. When I was in Manhattan, I also felt the same way. I was, I had a career as a musician and it was reasonably successful. And one of my musician friends one day when I was on a crosstown bus in Manhattan, Grand Street bus, this person gave me a piece of paper. It was a wrinkled piece of paper that had what he called the Swami's address on it. I thought I would go along and see you who this person was. Maybe he wasn't a hypocrite, and he was in a very unpopular part of, of town called the Bowery, uh, kind of the skid row of Manhattan, you might say. So I decided to go along and have a look and have a listen. One thing that, that impressed me very much when I first met Prabhupada uh, that, that, that he said was, I am not this body. I knew that there was a deeper meaning to it because I didn't feel that way myself, but I thought that he, for one, really felt that way. He looked very distinguished. He was an older person. He was from India, and he had all of the makings of a, of a spiritually realized person. I've met persons before who I I've, I've found some faults with. They were hypocritical in one way or another. But when I met Srila Prabhupada, I didn't find these, these difficulties. So I approached him. I approached him at the end of his conversation. And uh, the first words that came out of my mouth were, I have a tambora. That's the first thing I said to him. And the first thing he said to me, he said, then bring it. And he gestured this way, then bring it. So I came a few days later with the tambora. And, and he was chanting, he was speaking. He had a big book in front of him. I didn't know what the book was, but every once in a while he would glance down and read from the book. It was a book of Sanskrit, apparently, a very large book. And I was impressed by the whole surrounding atmosphere. It was a very unkept, unkempt and um, desultory sort of place, the, the, a loft in the Bowery. And I thought, well, there can't really be anything that's wrong with this. I thought, I'll, I'll just keep continuing to come and see what he has to say. I think what happened was that I was involved in, in a kind of, you might say, legal and police problem. Uh, it was the kind of a problem where people kind of shunned me or ignored me. My phone stopped ringing, for example, and the person who came to tune my piano, for, for one, didn't respond, didn't call. And probably the first person that called me was Prabhupada. He called me Mr. Michael. And, and he said, almost his exact words were, Mr. Michael, there has been some trouble, in a, in a questioning way. And I didn't tell him exactly what it was, but I kind of minimized it more than, than it really was. And then he invited me to come to his place which I did, and had lunch with the devotees and Prabhupada himself. I thought Prabhupada was very uh, unjudgmental. He 
respected me and he called me Mr. Michael, which was unusual for someone to, to uh, append the word Mr. to a first name. But he was very, almost fatherly, you might say, or grandfatherly. And it was very, he was one of the, probably the only person that, that maintained contact with me after I had, my, my reputation had been smirched. My musical colleagues didn't uh, want to have anything to do with me because my uh, problem appeared in the New York Times and many of those people had actually read about it. And I thought that this was a very significant thing. The Prabhupada had heard about it, but at the same time he, he was not, um, you know, dismissing me or in any way making, belittling me or thinking that, that he shouldn't have anything to do with me. Uh, one day before I was initiated, I was walking north on 3rd Avenue with a, a fellow named Raya Rama, Raymond Marias is his legal name. And he said that the Swami is going to be conducting initiation. Would you like to take part? And I thought, wow, what is this initiation? I'd never heard the, the word before uh, related to what, what we were doing. And he said, well, I don't know much about it either, Raya Rama said. He said that what, what, what Swamiji said was that it means that you take your guru as God. And I thought to myself, that can't be right. I can't, he's not God, obviously. And then we, I learned later that Vishwanath Chakravarti said that, that a guru is to be taken as good as God. So that was quite different. And during the initiation ceremony, there were several people. I, I decided to do it, but I didn't know what it meant. I just thought, oh, it's some sort of a rite of passage. Why not? Everyone else is doing it that I know. Why not do it? And uh, afterwards, I went back to where I was domiciled and, uh, and saw Allen Ginsberg on television chanting Hare Krishna. So that was a kind of symbolic gesture to me that I did, had done the right thing. Srila Prabhupada, when he learned that I had played piano for my livelihood, he, he said, well, you can play the piano for Krishna. And I thought to myself, how, how is that possible? I'd never heard of an Indian piano player. And I told him in, in relation to this that I was going to go to India to study how to play the flute. Prabhupada said, do you, do you know that, that flute players in India often spit up blood? And I never heard that before. But it kind of turned me off to the idea of learning how to play the Indian flute because it's a very difficult instrument to play for one thing and I for sure didn't want to be spitting up blood. What I later learned from Prabhupada, uh, from this, we called him the Swami then, was that it really didn't matter. One thing he said to me that I always will remember is that I, I will teach you how to play the piano for Krishna. And I really didn't understand how that was possible. But he was so convincing and so convinced that he would do that, that I believed him anyway, even though I didn't see that it was a possibility. One thing that sticks in my mind is that I was kind of a literary person and I was interested in the Sanskrit language. When uh, I was informed by Prabhupada that he would be holding classes in this loft in, in the Bowery, I suggested that he teach people how to read and speak the Sanskrit language. Somehow or other, he got a, a, a blackboard. I think it was, had been put in a trash can somewhere. It was really a, a, a messy looking board. It had, it, its sides were all, all, all uh, you know, uh, it would look like an old throwaway thing. But he wrote on the board uh, a Sanskrit mantra from the Brahma Samhita which goes Satchitananda Vigraha Anadi Vradi Govinda Sarvakarana Karanam. That it's a famous verse from the, from the book. And I didn't realize at the time that what he was really doing was teaching us the spiritual philosophy of Krishna consciousness, even though it was in the Sanskrit language. But I was more interested in the language itself. And I got a book called First Lessons in Sanskrit Grammar by Judith M. Tyberg. I remember the book and uh, there was a place called the Orientalia Bookstore. The Orientalia Bookstore was located in uh, Manhattan. And somehow or other, I found this place and got this book and learned how to write some of the Sanskrit characters with a certain type of pen. Anyway, that was the first lesson type of, of, of uh, setting that I was in with Srila Prabhupada when he wrote on this blackboard and, and had everyone who was in the class learn this verse from the, from the Brahma Samhita. Well, you might say that 
Prabhupada had an agenda when he put this verse on the board. And he had us uh, learn the verse, how to write it, and how to memorize it. And after a one or a week or so, the, the Sanskrit class kind of dissolved. There weren't any further classes. And uh, gradually, over a period of time, maybe it was quite a bit later, I realized that it was kind of a ruse on the part of Prabhupada to teach us the grammar and, and uh, flow of, of a Sanskrit poem, so to speak, and uh, not follow through with it. Because what he was really interested in was, was getting us to understand the philosophy of Krishna consciousness in a way that we could adapt to it. So he was taking, in a sense, my desire to learn the, another language in a, in, in, in a way to, to inculcate the Krishna conscious philosophy in me. What uh, struck me about the philosophy most was Prabhupada saying on our first visit, on my first visit anyway, was that I am not this body. I'd never heard anyone ever say that before. And as, as I said before, I, I didn't realize that I was not my body, but I, I thought that he thought that way, and so that it must be true. And then I, the, I think it was on my first visit, or second visit, that I got the books that he brought from India. And I started to read the philosophy after I got those books. I was reading the philosophy in those books almost nonstop. I thought that he used the word uh, unlucky or unfortunate in, in the first part of the, the Srimad Bhagavatam, the books that I was reading, that he was kind of very gentle, not saying that he disliked the way things were going, that there was, a, I, he wrote later on that there was a pinprick in society at large, but that he was calling the people of this age unfortunate and unlucky. Uh, that, and he said, I think above all, they were unfortunate and unlucky. And that struck me as a very gentle way to say that it was a, a messed up society, which he later did say, but, but to someone like me, who was maybe a little bit acerbic uh, on occasion, it was a very gentle way of saying it. Well, one day, while I was at visiting Srila Prabhupada, hearing him speak, he said that next Sunday we will have a love feast. And I thought love feast was a very unusual phrase for a, an aged uh, sadhu or spiritual person to use because it was kind of a hippie term, love and love feast. It just sounded like very unusual. I went along to see what it would be like anyway. And, and uh, Prabhupada showed a completely different side to him. He was the gracious host. He, under one arm, he had a bucket or pan full of, of prasadam and he was plopping it down on people's plates and saying more, take more, take more. And, and, and apart from being a, a, a spiritually advanced person, he was a gracious host. And, and I didn't see that other side of him at all at time. He was just a very gracious host asking everyone to eat to their heart's content. And it was, it was very uh, sumptuous, very wonderful. Uh, one of the preparations I remember was something made with what we call chickpeas or gram flour. Uh, it was a, all, the, all the things were very delectable and they were strange, but they were very good. And almost everyone enjoyed, enjoyed the, the, uh, the feast. It was a love feast, but it was an unusual term to hear from his lips. Prabhupada taught many of the devotees to cook with love. Most of them were the, the female devotees uh, he taught some of the men, but I wasn't one of them, unfortunately. His sister, her name was Pishima, once sent a can of, of uncooked or partially cooked pompadams. It's a kind of, of a chapati type of thing made with gram flour. And uh, they were folded over. And we didn't know what it was. I, I was in his room when Prabhupada opened the can of these pompadams and I said, what are these? I remember asking him, what are these? And he said, I will show them how to cook these. And he showed some of the girls how to cook them, as I remember, and they were very, very unusual, but very good tasting. One of the things Prabhupada uh, taught the, the devotees that he was teaching to cook, that they should be cooking for Krishna and not tasting anything while they were in the process of cooking. One of the preparations he made was we called pineapple sweet rice. It was a rice 
preparation made with uh, cream and sugar and, believe it or not, pineapple. There was a device, kind of like a, uh, you know, um, uh, what do you call those things that, that they evaporate over a stove? It was shaped like a, uh, like a trapezoidal kind of thing, and I'd never seen one before. And he said, if you put the pineapple in this, it'll, it'll, pineapple will, droplets will come out of the bottom, and those should go into the sweet rice. So he taught the, the devotees, the, the girls, how to make it, and it was the first time that that preparation had ever been eaten. He taught them how to cook samosas and pakoras and many other wonderful things, but he said that it was all very delectable because it was prepared for Krishna. It wasn't, it wasn't for their own palates and for the palates of the people they were cooking for. It was that they were cooking it because they, they were devoted to Krishna. That was the, the way he taught them how to cook with love, so to speak. He, he taught that love wasn't a, a thing of this material world, that real love only took place between devotees and the Supreme Lord Krishna. When uh, Prabhupada was in, in his first place at the Bowery, Five Bowery, five, that was the, the street number, Five Bowery, New York, he had a conflict with the 18-year-old person that he was living with. He said that the man had ill, quote his words, ill named me, ill named me. In other words, he used uh, swear words. He was angry with Prabhupada. And I heard Prabhupada say that, that he had put some soap in the shower and it was in the wrong place or something to that effect. So one day he decided to just pack up and depart from that place and he went to my place. I was also living in the Bowery in a, in a, just very near to where Prabhupada was and Prabhupada came to me and he started talking, uh, telling me about this conflict he was having with this 18 year old boy that was sharing the loft with him. And uh, I thought that the person was kind of, you know, maybe a little bit unbalanced but more or less harmless. And then Prabhupada said, looking straight at me, he said, we have a saying in Bengal that you take a spiritual master, you kill him, you move his dead body aside, and he gestured like, you move his dead body aside, he gestured like that, and then you become the guru. And then at that very point, I realized that, that this man was actually dangerous. He was not just deranged, he was a, a dangerous person, he could actually cause physical harm to the person he was living with. And that is what I realized with, with Prabhupada, that he had to, to leave that place. And I helped him find another place. It wasn't going to be my place because it was full of musical instruments and very noisy all, at all hours. But I did help him find another place, which he moved to uh, that, that very day. At about that time, I realized that, that uh, the Swami needed a better place to operate from. For one thing, the, the lofts were not on the ground floor. The first loft that he was in was, was four stories or four floors up. The second one was three floors up and I thought that he needed a better location to operate from. I took it upon myself to find such a location, but I didn't know how to go about it. What I finally did was I went to a newsstand where a newspaper called The Village Voice arrives before any other newsstands. And I looked in the, in the uh, lofts or, 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 or storefronts for, for rent or for sale section and found this place called 26 Second Avenue. <coughs> and I, I went to the nearest telephone booth and phoned and made an appointment to see the, the rental agent. I think I saw him the next day. It, was a, it happened very fast. So that was the day that I rode my bicycle. It was a very sunny day in Manhattan, and uh, it was in May or June, and it was kind of warm out, and, and I, I rode up and put my bicycle, I locked it uh, on a, in a parking meter, and, and, and waited for this rental agent to appear. When he appeared, his name was Mr. Gardiner, he, he looked very, uh, very uh, bouncy, kind of. That's the way I would describe the way he looked. He, he wore a blue denim, pants and a, a t-shirt and uh, and the other person that was there with him was uh, Prabhupada came a few moments later but the other person that was there with him was a, a, a fellow named Carl Carl and I had become friends he lived in in the area so finally uh, Prabhupada came along after Mr. Gardner and Mr. Gardner and Prabhupada and Carl and I went and sat on the inside 
And uh, he said that this place is for rent, 26 Second Avenue, and I'm willing to let you have it. And he told us that it was going to be a hundred, I think it was a hundred dollars per month. And we said, okay, we'll, we'll manage. And we kind of looked at each other because we didn't know where the money was going to come from. But eventually between Carl and I, we figured we could raise at least a hundred dollars every month. It was a very small amount actually. And Prabhupada agreed to that. And he said, actually, we can, uh, we can make you, and uh, he was speaking to me, and Mr. Gardiner, a, tr a trustee of our society. Would you like to be a trustee of our society? He said to Mr. Gardiner. And at the same time, he gave Mr. Gardiner the three Bhagavatam books that he had brought with him from India. And Mr. Gardiner looked very kind of flattered to, to hear that he would be made a trustee. Trustee is kind of an unusual word. It, it, it's more than just a member. It's, it's like being a, a senior person of an organization, like, like something really, really uh, uh, upper class. And Mr. Gardner liked that idea. And he said, but instead of paying the, the, the monthly fee, and this is all new to me, a monthly fee. I never heard about a trustee or a monthly fee or organization that didn't even exist. Uh, and Mr. Gardner was very impressed with the books. And he said, okay. And, and Prabhupada went on to say, instead of paying, instead of paying you $100, Per month, we'll make you a trustee at, at and and that's fifteen dollars per month. So so you uh, will only pay you eighty five dollars. And Mr. Gardner kind of he was a little taken aback because he hadn't heard that before, but then he agreed to do it very miraculously. And he said that he that he had another place in the same building that Prabhupada could live in a, 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 an apartment. And Prabhupada and we all kind of like looked at each other. Where were we going to raise the money for that place too? Because that was only going to be eighty five dollars. And uh, finally, we decided to do it, and, and Prabhupada agreed, and that became his first residential quarters, right across from, from the storefront on uh, 26 Second Avenue, through the courtyard and up one flight of stairs. Being a trustee didn't, carry, didn't seem to carry with it any, any responsibilities, because after this incident at, at, at acquiring the 26 Second Avenue storefront, it kind of like never came up again. Uh, it was mentioned very briefly, but it never actually came up again. And a little later on, Prabhupada had his organization incorporated. But, but the trustee and the, the International Society for Krishna Consciousness, that all seemed to exist before it became official. The, uh, the legal aspect of making ISKCON an International Society for Krishna Consciousness, or ISKCON, came about through uh, a lawyer named Stephen Goldsmith in Manhattan, who was a, a regular visitor or attendee at Prabhupada's classes at Second Avenue. And eventually he got the society in officially incorporated as the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. And Stephen Goldsmith was the lawyer who made this actually happen. There was no ceremony. It just happened kind of quietly. One day it was official and, and the next day it was still official. And it's still official today. Prabhupada uh, realized that this was important to be made into an official corporation because corporations withstand the, the comings and goings of their various uh, chief executive officers and various trustee boards and things like that. So after a while, I realized that actually it was a very intelligent move, even though I thought it was kind of an unnecessary move. But I, I realized that Prabhupada could foresee the need to have an official organization incorporated in, in at least in the place where he was located. I was vaguely aware that Prabhupada had a certain business sense to him, even though he was a, uh, officially a, uh, a, a, a spiritual person. When I say officially a spiritual person, that's the way I looked at him. I'd, one day he asked me to, to uh, have um, the, the, uh, the Con Edison Utilities Company give us electricity free of charge because of uh, us being a charity. And when I said this to the person, at, at the, the agent at, at the utility, Con Edison, he looked at me as if I were crazy. And he, he said, well, I'm sorry, I can't help you. And, and I conveyed that story to Srila Prabhupada that day or the next day. And he said, okay. And then I found out later that he himself went and saw the very same person and got him to, to uh, either discount 100% or discount very, uh, very somewhat the electricity bill. Because he, he, because actually Prabhupada was right that being a charity, we were in, entitled to a certain discount. He knew that, and then I sensed that he had a certain uh, integrity about about uh, what could be done and what should be done. 
uh, with an uh, official uh, charitable organization and that he was very intelligent from, from a material point of view as well as a spiritual point of view. That, that's one of the things I realized about him early on. Well, when I first heard it about a person named Mishra or Dr. Mishra, uh, I heard that, that, that uh, Prabhupada, who was then known as the Old Swami, was lecturing in Dr. Mishra's apartment somewhere, somewhere in, New, in Manhattan. And then, then his name was forgotten. One day, Prabhupada announced that, that he would be taking all of us devotees on a field trip. He didn't use the term field trip, but we kind of understood it was in a place called Monroe, New York, upstate New York. There was an ashram there, maybe of about four or five or six, I forget the size of it, number of acres. And it was Dr. Mishra's ashram, his country ashram. One day when, when Dr. Mishra was away from that ashram, Prabhupada held class. It was a late afternoon or evening class. And it was mostly populated by devotees. But there were a few people there who were from Dr. Mishra's ashram. They were either ashramites or people who were frequenters of Dr. Mishra. They had a book that Dr. Mishra had written. Prabhupada, during his class, was talking about, about various things, about Vaishnavism. And these two men that were uh, disciples or friends of Dr. Mishra, or regular followers, began to argue with Prabhupada during the question period. And they said, because they were kind of impersonalists, they said that, um, that, uh, that there was a phrase called, I am a bubble, make me the sea, which is a kind of Shankarite version of, of jnana or impersonality. And Prabhupada said, well, before you read more of the book, answer me this one question. If the gold in a gold ring and, and the gold in the gold mine are the same, then, um, but they're also different, is there a difference between the gold in the gold mine and the gold ring? And, and this st stimulated a lot of questioning, a lot of further questioning on the part of these two men. And, and, and eventually Prabhupada was saying that the gold ring and the gold mine are simultaneously one and different. This was a concept that these two men found very difficult to assimilate. This was the first time I ever saw Prabhupada get a little angry or agitated. He th he, these two men were, were advocating that there's no difference at all ever between the, the, uh, the gold in the gold mine and the gold in the gold ring. But Prabhupada was trying to teach them that there was a difference. They were the same in quality, but different in quantity, and that this was a major difference. So Prabhupada got a little angry, and it was the first time I'd ever seen that mood of Prabhupada uh, uh, becoming angry. But that happened at the Monroe Ashram in New York City, in Upper State in New York. And they never surrendered. As far as I know, these two men never changed their, their, their conviction about being impersonalists or diehard impersonalists, we might say. And they were, they were older than most of us. They were probably in their late 20s or early 30s and they were dressed in business suits, very, uh, mu un, very much unlike the, the uh, sort of hippie alternatives that we all were, even though not all of us had long hair. I, th I think when, when uh, Srila Prabhupada had a bit of an altercation with these two men, I saw another side of him that he was not only a teacher, but he was a fighter. He would fight for what was right, even though he would encounter imposing elements. When, when there was a philosophical discussion, he would fight for what was right. And, and in, many, in most cases, he would win that fight. It was clear to me from videos I've seen and from what Prabhupada had said that they were actually good friends, even though they, they differed philosophically in very um, diametrically opposed ways. But at the end, Dr. Mishra was very kind for, to Prabhupada. He let him stay in his flat and he let him lecture. And uh, they sometimes would eat together and they were, they were on a very friendly basis, even though that philosophically they were at odds. One day when I was speaking with Carl, Carl had told me that he had a discussion with the Swami and that he told that he confessed to the Swami that actually he was a drug dealer as, you know, not, not exclusively, but that was one of the, his means of livelihood. And he said that Prabhupada said that I also used to deal drugs. What I learned later was that Prabhupada was the proprietor of a, a drug company. 
So they were legal drugs as opposed to illegal drugs, if there is such a thing. One of the things that uh, I wrote about in my book is, is uh, the fact that when Prabhupada was on 26 Second Avenue, he gave a lecture. At the end of a lecture, a, a man came in to the storefront who looked very disheveled. He, he smelled like a liquor factory, and his pants were very baggy, his hair was very messed up, and he reached inside his coat as if he were reaching for a pistol. I didn't know what he was going to do, and, and out came a roll of toilet paper, and he proceeded to plunk it down on Prabhupada's lectern, and then he walked out. And, and Prabhupada, as I remember, just kind of said, see, he is service-minded. And the next day, the same man came back to 26th Second Avenue, or two days later, and this time he, he didn't have baggy pants, his hair was combed, and he, and he was sober, and he just sat down and, and listened. So it was a whole different thing. He had transformed, become a completely different person. But I think he was, I mean, maybe it's speculation, but I think he was affected by having had Prabhupada's association, that he became a, a much more genteel human being. One evening during the, the question period, after, after the Swami had lectured, the lawyer, Stephen Goldsmith, stood up and asked him this question. I mean, I don't know it word for word, but basically he said, if God is so kind, why is he letting so many American boys die in Vietnam? And Prabhupada, without even waiting for, for a half of a second, immediately answered, God is, is seeing that you're killing so many cows, so he's saying, send your sons to the slaughterhouse. And he made this kind of a gesture, send your sons to the slaughterhouse. Goldsmith's response to that uh, uh, rejoinder was that he just sat down and accepted what Prabhupada said as being true. It was just too much for him to absorb all at once, it seemed. Uh, another, an, another field trip was Prabhupada took about 10 devotees, uh, ramshackle devotees that we were, to uh, have a peace vigil in front of the United Nations Secretariat at 34th Street and uh, the, the uh, east side of Manhattan. And at first we started chanting, standing up and, and carrying on like a proper Hari Nam party. And then officials came out and told us that we couldn't sing we had, and we couldn't stand, we had to sit. So the rest of the vigil was a sit down, quiet vigil. But Prabhupada had given us the peace formula, which was the, 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 the fifth verse, uh, 29th verse of the fifth chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Bhaktaram Jagatapasam Logateshwara Vasaparam. That means that uh, knowing these three things, that Krishna is the supreme owner, the supreme proprietor, the supreme friend, one can attain peace. That's the translation, peace from the pangs of material miseries. So Prabhupada designated this as the peace formula, and this peace formula was printed out and handed out when we were sitting at the United Nations uh, Secretariat, knowing that Krishna is the supreme proprietor, the supreme friend, and supreme owner. The, uh, the only reaction we were aware of was that the, a newspaper called the Washington, or the New York Post, not the Washington Post, the New York Post, uh, published a photograph of devotees sitting on there on the sidewalk in, uh, opposite the, the United Nations Secretariat and there was an article uh, right next to it saying that, that the B-52 bombers had bombed North Vietnam. But it was, it was kind of an interesting juxtaposition of a photograph and an article about, about the, the turmoil that was going on in the world. We were advocating peace, and here was what was a, a, a reality check on what was really happening in the world, that, that bombers were bombing Vietnam, U.S. bombers. When, when uh, I was in San Francisco with Srila Prabhupada, I told him that I wanted to learn how to play these instruments, particularly the murdanga, because murdangas had recently come by boat, presumably, from India. So I, I had a session where he was the teacher and I was the student. The beat I learned was gitata, kitata, gitata, gitata. And he, he told me how to hit, strike the murdanga to get the sounds, and he said that Whenever one would play the murdanga, one had to utter these sounds. He said that the sounds should be 
like the, the sound that the drum makes. When I was playing the merdunga, he was standing, I was in lotus posture, sitting on the floor. I tended to, to speed up, and he said, slow down. So I started to, to, uh, to slow down and to keep it at a steady pace, and I imagined ocean waves going at a steady pace, that they weren't increasing or they weren't decreasing. And then I just continued to play for a minute or so, like that, without speeding up. And I had a sense that Prabhupada was still there, although he was standing, but I didn't know whether he was listening, whether he had gone in the other room, or I, I wasn't really sure where he was. I kind of thought he was still standing, but maybe he wasn't. Maybe he had gone in the other room. So I, I kind of opened my eyes slightly and saw that he was still standing there, saw his feet, and then I looked up and saw him kind of shaking, wobbling his head from side to side, like he was, and, and slightly smiling, like he was enjoying a student kind of, you know, through his very, very first motions of learning something, doing it properly. And that he was actually getting as much or more pleasure out of seeing this than I was out of playing the drum. One day when I was in Prabhupada's room when the San Francisco temple had uh, uh, first started, I was sitting in front of Prabhupada and a man burst in the room, fellow that had been a regular, and he said that, Swamiji, your uh, prime minister has been stoned. And, and uh, Swamiji looked up very innocently and said to him, um, why was that? And then this man proceeded to say that he had read in a newspaper article that there was a very severe drought in Maharashtra and that People stoned the prime minister because they blamed her, it was Indira Gandhi at the time, for the drought. And Prabhupada, and he thought that Prabhupada would, would be very stricken with this news. But Prabhupada kind of smiled and said to him, this shows that, that, they, that, they, that, that everything is very personal in India, that they blame the leader for anything that goes wrong, even if the weather is, is improper or you know, in, in any way causing, causing difficulty. These, so a number of the people who were farmers in that state, in that part of India, converged upon the prime minister and, and began to blame her and stone her. So Prabhupada picked out the, the good part of that to show that, that uh, people in India tend to blame the leader when anything goes wrong. That, that was still, there was still a vestige of Vedic culture existing even in modern day India. In San Francisco in 1967, on Prabhupada's first visit, at the end of his class, he asked for questions. One man was standing at the opposite him, with kind of leaning up against the wall in a standing posture, and pretty much everyone else was sitting. And he had his hands in his pocket, and he asked this kind of challenging question to Prabhupada because he knew that Prabhupada had something to do with the poet Allen Ginsberg. He asked Prabhupada, are you Allen Ginsberg's guru? And he said it in a kind of challenging tone. Prabhupada immediately looked down and answered, I am nobody's guru, I am everybody's servant. And that was the end of that. And that person didn't ask any further questions and just accepted the answer he got. When Prabhupada said that I am nobody's guru, I'm everyone's servant, I realized that Prabhupada spoke this out of humility, partly, and partly because he didn't want the, the man to think that he was arrogant or that he thought he was the, the mentor of, of a famous poet. So it was a kind of a two-sided thing, but I think the thing that, that uh, resonated most with me was Prabhupada's humility, when, because he said that from his heart. He said, actually, he wanted the man to know that he's not the guru of anyone, he's everyone's servant. Uh, one day, a, a lady knocked on Prabhupada's door late at night or early in the morning. It was either 12 midnight or 1 o'clock in the morning. And Prabhupada dutifully got up and answered the door. And all she could say, because she was highly deranged, was, Baha'u'llah, you're not ready. And she stomped off. Then he came to, to my apartment, which was very nearby, and, and told me what had happened. And from that day on, it was decided that there would, that Prabhupada would have a buzzer in his room to ring someone in the temple 
or to buzz someone in the temple, which was four stories below the temple room, if anything like this had ever happened. So that was the reason that Prabhupada started to have a, a either a, a electronic servant or a physical servant from that point on. Because the, the uh, people in the Haight-Ashbury were very unpredictable, to say the least. Oh, one day, a, we had met a person who owned a recording studio in Oakland, California, just nearby San Francisco, across the Bay Bridge. <clears throat> so we recorded a song that Hayagriva had written the words to, Narada Muni, and I had written the music to, Narada Muni. It was called Narada Muni, the Eternal Spaceman. And on the other side of, of the 45 record, at that time we had 45 RPM records, uh, vinyl records, um, we recorded the Hare Krishna mantra, kind of a, a nice lilting sort of version of the mantra with a sitar. And it was recorded in this recording studio. A few days later, we told Prabhupada what had happened. The owner of the, of the studio wasn't present, but he had given us the keys, so we had the full use of all the facilities of the recording studio. When we told Prabhupada what had happened, he said, oh, that's very good, immediately print a thousand copies. We didn't have enough money to print a thousand copies, so we printed a hundred. And it, we were uh, um, uh, very attuned to the fact that Prabhupada was not only a, a, a sadhu or a holy person, but a very business-minded person because he knew the value of, of having a hundred recordings or a thousand recordings. There are a group, uh, 13 to be exact, groups of, of, of uh, pseudo-sampradayas or apa-sampradayas. And one group were, were uh, called the Bowels of Bengal. And they were, they were brought from India, this group of people. They're like the Sahajas are another of the <coughs> apa-sampradaya group. Um, they were brought to, to the United States by a guy named Grossman. I think his name was Alan or Alvin Grossman, who was the, the uh, agent for Bob Dylan at the time. And one day, unbeknownst to, to myself, this, this uh, fellow, we'll call him Subal, was, uh, who was dressed in, in uh, very bright colored orange robes, came along with about three or four other people who were also dressed in bright orange robes. And Subal held a, a, a black poodle in his arms. And, and he was standing at the door of the temple. So because he was, looked like he was from India, he was dark skinned and had black hair, I thought, well, put aside the no dogs in the temple rule for the time being and let him come in and see what he wants. He told us about the fact that he was brought over to the United States from India and who brought him. And he said, and here I, I'm giving you tickets to the Fillmore Ballroom where we'll be performing on Saturday night. So that was, and then, then he, they all left. And we went to see their performance or, uh, that night and it was kind of uh, inconclusive. Uh, un, unusual, but not really very inspiring. So a few days later, this uh, Subal character and his, his uh, uh, henchmen from India were at a place called the Strait Theater, where we had a kirtan with uh, a large number of, of, uh, of visitors, they called them hippies, of, of Haight-Ashbury. And, and d at the end of the kirtan, he spun around, fell on the ground as if unconscious. Most of the hippies in the, in the uh, audience thought that he was in some kind of a mystical trance. But the few of us kind of realized that he was sort of faking, like they have a tendency to do in, in that part of the world. So the next day, or the, yeah, the next, the next morning, I told Prabhupada exactly everything that had happened, that we had a kirtan, all the seats were removed from this place. It used to be called the Hate Theater. It was then called the Straight Theater. We had a big kirtan, and there was this guy that was part of the bowels that was spinning around and fell down on the ground, and people, most of the people thought he was in some kind of a mystic trance. And Prabhupada said, you should have said to him, and, and I said to Prabhupada that it seems like this person was impersonating Lord Chaitanya. And the Swamiji's instruction to me was, you should have said, my dear Chaitanya, and he smiled very, very benevolently, and then kick on his face. And he, 
he, he made a gesture with his foot as if he were kicking on his face. And so I, I felt very, uh, uh, you know, ex exonerated from, from my, my kind of uh, unfavorable comment towards this guy named Subal. But I, was I felt very much vindicated after what Prabhupada had said, that, that he saw through the fakery and, and all this sort of charlatanism that had gone on, and that, that uh, so many people were, were dil diluted and misled. And he was very upset with that. Not upset, but he just said that what, what should have been done is that I should have called a spade a spade sort of thing and, and kicked on this guy's face for impersonating Lord Chaitanya. Several times, the owners of the psychedelic shop, two brothers named Ron and Jay Phelan, invited us to come into the psychedelic shop with the Swami in the evening and that he should give a class there. We diplomatically resisted this. Uh, they invited us on several occasions, but we diplomatically refused to go because we knew it was a bit too seedy of a place for Prabhupada to go, especially on a weekend evening, which is when we were invited. We finally relented and decided to go to the psychedelic shop with the Swami. And as we were walking up Haight Street, it was uh, the far end of Haight Street from where, where the temple was located, um, there was all kinds of strange things going on. People were, were making um, drawings on the, on the sidewalk. They were wearing uh, weird clothes. They had tie-dyed outfits on and faces painted with acrylics. And, uh, and I remember, and Prabhupada was taking all this in, and it had the smell of, of marijuana or pot in the air. It was a Saturday night. It was a typical Saturday night in Haight-Ashbury. Prabhupada was taking it all in. I was walking beside him, and uh, I, I really didn't know what to say, because it was almost too, uh, too um, there, there was almost uh, too, too much seediness and, and for, for Prabhupada to take in. And, 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 and then I, and then I th finally decided to say something because the long silence was a little awkward. But, and, and Prabhupada was taking in all this sleaze as if it were just okay. And I said to Prabhupada, well, it's a, it's a very nice night, meaning it's a warm night or something like that. And Prabhupada just kind of kept looking around and finally he turned to me and he said, everything is beautiful. And then, and then we finally got to the psychedelic shop about four blocks down. We were not on Haight Street. The temple was uh, near, on a nearby street, but it was very close by. So we got into this psychedelic shop, into the, 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 what they called the temple room. The temple room consisted of four, uh, one, two, three, four, five madras bed spreads. Each one was about uh, three yards uh, square. And inside the room, there were maybe three or four people, and they were all kind of drugged out or dozed out and some of them were very rough looking people and, and you know they had scars on their face and we didn't know whether they were awake or they were asleep and while Prabhupada one of the things Prabhupada said in his his lecture to the people in the in the he called it the meditation room that was the temple room of the of the of the psychedelic shop and in, in the meditation room he started talking about the Aryan civilization and some of the people in that room were were uh, the very people that the Adolf Hitler uh, was uh, prosecuting. And we thought that, well, when we leave the psychedelic shop, these people are going to come after us because Prabhupada was saying the Aryans were the highly civilized people. And indirectly, he was kind of sanctioning Adolf Hitler. And, and we knew that some of the people in, in that so-called meditation room were, were offended by that. But we didn't know whether they were awake, asleep, or in a drug, drugged out doze or whatever. But I was certain that they were going to come after us and, and, and uh, start a big brawl or fight. And nothing happened. We just walked back to the temple very peacefully, and that was the end of that. It was a very strong lesson that, that uh, the truth can be spoken no matter who's listening. Uh, and that Prabhupada would speak always the truth, even though there, there might be some, some uh, uh, negative reactions to it. I, I, had, I was driving Srila Prabhupada back from a visit to uh, a, a Mr. Gandhi, who was either the council general or the ambassador of India to the U.S. after a meeting. And uh, it was very difficult driving, chauffeuring him, because I felt very sleepy. And I asked Prabhupada, how much sleep should, I, should we be getting each night? And he, at that time, intoned 
to me that we should, you should get at least six hours every night. So I thought that was kind of a relief because sometimes I was sleeping two hours, sometimes I was not sleeping at all. So it was a, a, quite a relief to know that it was possible to be Krishna conscious and, and get a decent night's sleep at the same time. Prabhupada went back to New York after his first trip to San Francisco and we heard that, that he had suffered a heart attack or a stroke and that he was hospitalized for a short time and that he was going to be going to India to recuperate. Then after a couple of months or whatever time was required for his recuperation, he returned to San Francisco as he said he would. And instead of coming to the temple, we uh, had him domiciled in a place called Stinson Beach. Or, um, yeah, it's, it's near Stinson Beach. It's, not, it's, it's a, like a suburb of Stinson Beach. Just across the, the, uh, the, bay, the Golden Gate Bridge goes there. So Prabhupada was, was uh, still not quite normal, although he was better. And I asked him if, uh, how he was feeling one day. And I, when I asked him, I, I could tell that, that Hayagriva and Kirtananda, who were in the other room, were listening to what I was saying. And uh, I heard Prabhupada say that, what is this body? And he said it in such a way that, it really, that he didn't really care whether he was, f how he was feeling, but he, he really uh, was above feeling what the bodily pains were. So I, I kind of, and Hayagriva had asked me to ask him, what, what should we do if, if Prabhupada dies? Who, who will be the successor? Who will take over? And I, I asked him in a, in a, in a very kind of, tentative or sheepish way, what we should do if anything happened to him, if he should depart this world. And, uh, and then he didn't answer me right away. He just thought for maybe a minute. And then he said, actually, it is an insult to the spiritual master to, to ask that or to think that way. And then I felt very, very lowly and like I wanted to shrink into the carpet when I heard that. And I think that was the answer that was that became the answer that, that, that I, not only I heard, but that, that Kirtananda and Hayagriva who were in the next room heard, to, to, we shouldn't be thinking that way. That it wasn't proper. There's an event that occurred when, when Prabhupada was trying to get an extension for his visa. And he asked me to, to confer with the officials in, in the, United, the U.S. It was in San Francisco. So we went to a, a building in San Francisco, quite, uh, I think it was on the 40th floor, it was quite, quite a ways up there. And the, the lady, the official of the immigration, wanted to know if Prabhupada any, had any special qualifications, had he any books that were bestsellers, had he been in any films, and so on and so forth. And, and we had to, to honestly say no to all those questions. And she said that she, she wouldn't be able to, to help. The next thing I heard was that when Prabhupada went to Canada, which he went to uh, shortly after that, he, he met someone in the, in the Canadian Immigration Department who, who extended his visa so that he could stay in, in the United States for, any, uh, for a longer length of time. And then I, one of the things I learned from that is that, that uh, Prabhupada would find a way to kind of outsmart the bureaucrats, so to speak, and, and figure out a way to, to remain where he wanted to remain. One of the things that happened when, when we uh, talked with the immigration official in San Francisco was that uh, she, she said, how is it, how, how, are, how are you, how is your mission progressing here? How do you, and he said, well, it's, it's very simple. He said, all I have to do is remember Krishna all the time. And she said, oh, that's, that's very difficult. I don't see how that's possible. And he said, it's just like, it's just like a lady. She would never go outside without getting dressed properly. She would uh, always remember to get dressed. So remembering Krishna is that, is that much natural for, for all of us to remember Krishna. It's just like remembering to, to dress. This next event definitely occurred after Prabhupada returned from India to recuperate. He stayed in uh, Jamun and Gurudas's uh, flat or apartment on uh, Willard Street in San Francisco, about a block away from the temple, and it was so high up that we were, were very frightened if there was if there were any tremors, like earthquake tremors. And it so happened that one day there was a, 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 a fairly severe tremor. I don't know what the the uh, the numbers were, but it was like the whole building was rocking, 
and we thought if it gets any worse, we're going to be hurtled down to the level of the street, which was quite a ways below. There was a long flight of stairs to, to go up to where we were. And uh, it was quite terrifying for, for most of us. We just, everything just sort of stopped. All the conversation stopped and we w were waiting for something to happen. And then after a while, everything died down and, and it seemed that the, the, there were not going to be any further tremors and, and, and uh, it was peaceful. And, and we asked Prabhupada, uh, uh, what, what, was, what was that? And he asked us, what was that? And we said, well, that's an earthquake and we're on a, on a very, very strong earthquake uh, belt. And this happens and the whole city was destroyed about uh, 60 years ago from an earthquake. And Prabhupada just smiled and, and we could tell that he was very peaceful throughout the whole thing. And he said, well, if I, I don't know what exactly he said, but the, the uh, purport was that if, if uh, we die now, uh, we can be very blissful and happy. But obviously he wasn't disturbed or distraught or in any way fearful of an earthquake. When Prabhupada came to Los Angeles for the first time, he was invited to the program called The Les Crane Show. The Les Crane Show was a very popular weekly interview program on television. Um, I went on the program as Prabhupada's assistant and op sitting opposite us was a Youth for Christ minister and, and his disciple, so to speak. Uh, Les Crane was, was a very open-minded person and uh, he asked Prabhupada, he, he asked him um, some questions and then he turned to the Christian and he asked him very similar questions. But obviously he, he leaned towards Prabhupada. He, he liked him a lot better than the, than the standard Christian philosophy. At the end of the program, um, Prabhupada, we were walking away from the studio and Prabhupada asked me, about the Christians and he said, he said, what are, are, are they? And I told him that they were Christians and he said, um, are, are they afraid of us or, or, or what is their situation? And I said, I, I, I think they were afraid of us. That was pretty much what it had happened. And uh, it was obvious that Les Crane was, was w he was wearing a, a pendant that had Om at the bottom of it. And he was, ob and, uh, and, uh, and, and what I remember about him is that he had a turtleneck sweater on and that he, at the, at the, at the warm-up session, he was very much inclined towards Prabhupada, and he slanted his whole program towards Prabhupada. And, and, and uh, one of the things that he asked Prabhupada, that, he, that, uh, that someone in the audience stood up and asked the Christian, he said, if your religion is so good, why did you kill so many of my people? He was dressed like an American Indian. He said, if your religion is so good, why did you kill so many of my people? And, and this flustered the Christian person to a great extent and he didn't know what to say. He said, well, he said, I don't know where you got your information, but I, maybe that didn't even happen. Something to that effect. And then I was informed uh, uh, that Prabhupada was walking in Los Angeles the next day and, and someone uh, beeped his horn at him and waved to him and said, hiya, Swami. And Prabhupada turned to the people who were walking with him. I wasn't one of them. I was told this and he said, he has seen me on the television. I think that the reason that the Les Crane was more inclined towards Prabhupada was the fact that he was somewhat open-minded or maybe he had a, a penchant for Eastern philosophy because he was wearing an Om pendant at the beginning. So during the warm-up, he, he kind of realized what was going on and he said, well, what is your philosophy? He asked Prabhupada this. And Prabhupada just pulled out a pair of cartels and started chanting Hare Krishna. And Les Crane smiled at that and he kind of nodded his head in, in, to the beat. And he really seemed to be uh, favorable towards the Krishna consciousness movement right from the very start, even before they, were, they began the filming. One morning we went to uh, drive Prabhupada in the morning in Los Angeles to a place called Griffith Park. Within Griffith Park there's a, a, a zoological gardens or a zoo that's officially not open to visitors at that early time. We were there at about six in the morning or something like that. When we got to there, there was a large cage that, uh, that it encaged eagles. And Prabhupada was, uh, what is, was very curious. He said, what is this burden? We told him it was an eagle and it was the symbol of, of, of the United States. And then he went on to say, well, at least in India, the, the lion is our official animal mascot. And then he went on to say that even in the animal kingdom and in the bird kingdom, there are the modes of nature, ignorance, passion, and goodness. And, and 
in the mode of ignorance are the vultures and eagles, birds like this. At least the lion is in the mode of passion. That's much better. Prabhupada also described that monkeys were in the mode of ignorance and that cows were in the mode of goodness. So I decided to go to England from San Francisco because I wanted to do something that was adventurous, where at least they spoke the same language. So en route to London, I stopped at Montreal. And in Montreal, Prabhupada told us an interesting story. The story was told to us as a result of me asking Prabhupada if he had any last instructions of how we should conduct ourselves when we are in England. Immediately after asking this question, Prabhupada told a story of, of, a, of a silent film comedian named Max Sennett, or Charlie Chaplin, who was at a party. And the party was known as what Prabhupada called a ball dance. And during the ball dance, men would sit down and uh, some very naughty boys would put glue or nails on, on the bench where they would sit and would, would fasten the, their coattails to, uh, to the particular bench. And uh, when, they, when the man stood up, it ripped the, the uh, bottom part of his trousers out, exposing what Prabhupada called his thigh. It then happened that many of the other uh, men who were on the dance floor decided that this was a, a perfect fashion. So they went into the men's room and ripped the seat of their pants the, exactly as Max Sennett or Charlie Chaplin had done. And it started it, a fashion. And before long, the whole dance floor was full of people who had, had the seat of their pants ripped down, ripped out, and were dancing very enthusiastically. And that was the end of the story. And Prabhupada was kind of chuckling. On the way back from his apartment in Montreal, I was discussing with another devotee why Prabhupada told us that story after we asked the question about what are his last instructions on how we should conduct ourselves when we're in England. And then we realized that he told that story to show that if we do something that's unconventional or unusual, but we do it with great enthusiasm, like the man who had come to the dance floor, danced very enthusiastic, enthusiastically with the seat of his pants ripped down, that it would create a, a sensation or a fashion and it would become popular. So that was his last instruction. Do something unusual, but if you do it with enthusiasm, it'll be contagious and it will, it will be uh, successful. While I was in England, I was invited to come to Los Angeles to record something. And uh, somehow or other, Prabhupada got wind of this fact. And he wrote me another letter saying that, uh, that I shouldn't go to Los Angeles, even though it was very, uh, London was very cold and it was very wintry when I was there. And he said that we, you shouldn't think that you're a musician any more than that the people who are typists for me think that they are typists. And as a result of that, I, I felt kind of like, um, like chastised. When I was reading that letter, I was reading, I remember walking in, in South London where I was living at the time and, and feeling a little hurt that Prabhupada was forbidding me to, uh, to go to Los Angeles. And then by the time I reached my house, I was kind of like uh, okay with it, that, that I, I, I had a very definite instruction that I should stay, stay there in England. He's, and he also wrote in the letter that if you leave now, your uh, colleagues will be very discouraged. So I, I realized that, that being a servant of Krishna was the most important than, than, than anything else, than being a musician or a typist or whatever it might be, or businessman, that I should just try to learn to love Krishna and to do what he wants as his servant. That was the realization that I had from that letter. Sometime while I was in England, we were staying at John Lennon's estate in, in what was called the... Um, uh, concert room or the room where they held concerts. It was called officially the conservatory, but that was our temple room. It was a, a very a high ceilinged room, maybe about uh, 30 feet high from the ground. And uh, before that, uh, coming into that room, I had asked Srila Prabhupada, how are the kirtans conducted during the time of Lord Chaitanya? 
So he said, you, when you come to the temple next time, I'll show you. So when I came to the temple the next time, he showed us that we should be chanting and dancing and moving in a clockwise fashion around or in front of the guru. And the, when the lead singer sings, it should be relatively soft or, or not loud. And then when all the other players join in, it can be a lot louder. So it should be soft, loud, soft, loud, alternatively. And he also indicated that if, if I wanted to find out more about this, I could consult the Chaitanya Chaitamrita in the Majalila, which tells exactly how many Kartal players, how many singers, how many Murdungas are there. So that was Prabhupada's way of, 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 of telling me how kirtans should be conducted without going into a great detail about it. One time while Prabhupada was uh, in John Lennon's estate in the, in the servants' quarters, and I was in another part of the servants' quarters, he looked at me and I was wearing a sport coat that was a little soiled. And uh, he kind of looked at it and frowned and he said, in England you dress, then address. Do you understand what that means? He said to me, dress, then address. And I, I thought for a minute and then I thought, I, okay, I understand what it means. And then the next day I went out and, and bought a new suit, a uh, pinstripe blue suit. And I wanted to show Prabhupada what I had worn. But the problem was that where I, when I was on, on my way to, to meet him, the, the ground was very, very muddy. And I, I thought, okay, well, I'm going to show him. But at the same time, if I bow down, I'm going to get the, the, the knees of this new pair of trousers all, all muddy. So I stood up and I started to bow down. And then I thought, oh, I can't, I can't do it. I'm going to get muddy. And then I stood up again. And I, I think I must have looked to Prabhupada like I was a bobbing bird or something, like, you know, going up and down. And he just sort of smiled. And I finally got up to him and he reached me and, and, and he kind of wobbled his head as if to say, that's all right. But he, it, he, he uh, understood and liked the fact that I, that I was doing what he had said to do, was to purchase a new pair of clothes and not look like a, a, a bumpkin. While we, I was staying at uh, John Lennon's estate in the servants' quarters, along with Srila Prabhupada in a different section, we were all told that the bricklayer that was on hire by John Lennon had experienced ghosts. He confided in his wife, who confided, so-called, with other uh, female devotees, that he was hearing sounds that sounded like a body was being dragged across the, the floor above, where he was living in chains. But he didn't want uh, others to know about this. But somehow it did get back to Prabhupada that that was happening. And w the bricklayer was concerned that because he had heard these sounds that kept him awake at night, that he wouldn't be able to continue with his work of bricklaying for John Lennon. So it was becoming a very dangerous and critical situation. When Prabhupada heard about what was going on, he said that, that the devotee should go into the bricklayer's apartment when he wasn't there, have a, a roaring kirtan with blowing of conch shells and a very loud kirtan. It went on for, for at least four hours and that this would drive away the ghosts. What happened, we learned the next day, was that the bricklayer the following night didn't hear the sounds of the, what he thought were ghosts in the, in the rooftop and was able to get a good night's sleep and can carry on with his work. And so this, this story has a very happy ending. It's a true story, by the way, of an exorcism that was done by the holy name at the behest of, of, a, of a pure devotee. And uh, it saved a person's livelihood and life. When the devotees recorded with George Harrison the song Govinda, which called it Govindam, it was thought by devotees in Los Angeles that this was improper because a female voice had led the chorus. It was Jamuna's voice. So they rejected the, the idea that even though the, we were recording with one of the most famous uh, recording artists of the world, that it was improper. This all got back to Prabhupada and he wanted to hear the recording. He was now curious as to what it was that was causing so much of a stir. One day while he was sitting in the temple room in Los Angeles, he said, what is that song that the devotees recorded in, in England called Govindam? Can you play it for me? And they said, well, we can't play it here because we don't have such a, a, of a machine. 
And, and we said, and he told them, he said, well, you have the big speakers that you play every morning. Why can't we just play it on that? And, and so they very reluctantly got a copy of the recording, put it on the turntable, and it blasted out through the large speakers in the temple room. And everyone just kind of watched Prabhupada to see how he would react to it, because it had a rock and roll beat to it. And that was another thing that they objected to. There was not only a woman singing, but it had a, a kind of non-Indian, non-Vedic, non-Vaishnava beat to it. And they, all eyes were glued on Prabhupada. This is the story that, that uh, I heard, and it's been written in, in uh, Damodar Maharaja's book, that they watched Prabhupada very closely. And big tears streamed down Prabhupada's cheeks as he listened and listened and listened. And, and then, and then after, shortly afterwards, he said that this should be played in every temple, in all, of, all over the world, whenever the deities are greeted. And a little later on, a devotee, whose name I probably shouldn't mention, wrote to Prabhupada, and, and he said that his version of Govindam should be played instead of the one that, with Jamuna on it. And Prabhupada wrote back to him and said that in the letter, he said, well, we're playing it here. Prabhupada was in Vrindavan. We're playing it here, meaning Vrindavan. Why not play it everywhere? And that was the end of that. It, was, it became entrenched that it would be recorded with Jamuna's voice. It would be played, not only recorded, but played in every temple all over the world, all in the Inescon world, and it still is today. While I was in England, Prabhupada asked me to make a deposit in his bank account at Lloyd's Bank. I dutifully took the money, it was a very small amount, about, I th as I remember it was about 25 pounds, went to the Lloyd's Bank nearest the temple and dutifully deposited the money and they dutifully stamped the passbook and gave it back to me. When I went to Prabhupada, I gave him the passbook. He then said to me, they did not give you a receipt? And I said, no, I thought that the stamping the passbook would be enough. And he said, no, that's not right. They should have given you a receipt. Do you know what this means? And I, I, I thought, well, maybe they're, they're just you know, not, not very uh, astute at, at uh, transactions. I didn't know what to say, actually. And, and, I, and finally I said, I don't know. And, and Prabhupada said, think, what does it mean? And again, I said, I don't know. And then he said, it means that England is finished. When Lloyd's Bank doesn't give you a receipt, that means that England is finished. And he started to chuckle to himself and he said, I remember that there was a cartoon in the newspapers after the Second World War showing the, the British lion in tractions, that his one leg was, was in traction hanging from the ceiling. And he went on chuckling. And then I realized that Prabhupada was saying that if Lloyd's Bank, a, a very old established bank in England, wasn't giving receipts, it means that this, the so-called civilization of England, the, the former rulers of India, are, is, is no longer a world power. It's finished. This uh, <clears throat> also showed me another dimension of Prabhupada, that he wasn't a, 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 an aloof sadhu or paramansa or holy man who wasn't aware of what was going on in the world. He knew that there was a world war and that England was a very integral part of it and that it had, as a result of it, it had lost uh, its uh, position of a world power. So I got the realization that Prabhupada was not only a, a sadhu and a, a otherworldly person, but he knew what was going on in the world around him. And the very fact that I had returned without a receipt from, from uh, Lloyd's Bank had triggered all these thoughts in him. I know that some devotees might have a slightly different version of what happened when we went to get the uh, Radha London Ishwara deities from some friends of ours in the East London Hindu Center. What I remember is that there was a conversation between Prabhupada and the people who ran the, the East London Hindu Center, all in Hindi language. So. The people, the devotees that were there, namely myself, Jamuna, Tamal Krishna Maharaj, and Radha Raman, and, and one or two others, really didn't know what was being said. And then all of a sudden Prabhupada said in English, but we could tell, before Prabhupada started speaking in English, we could tell that, that, that there was some reticence on their part about giving us the deities. We didn't know what it was exactly. But what they were actually saying, we found out later, was that there was some damage to one of the deities. And then he spoke in English and he said, we have a man 
and he gestured towards Jamuna. And I thought that was very strange because Jamuna is not a man. And then, and then the conversation resumed back to its Hindi former discussion. And we didn't know what was going on. But we sort of knew that there was some damage done and, and there was some reluctance on the part of the people to give the deities to, uh, to Prabhupada. And then, then, uh, then um, this conversation resumed in Hindi and then we heard Prabhupada say in English, Tamal Krishna Maharaj and Radha Raman, can you just see how heavy Krishna is and if he's, and take him out to the van. The van was parked outside and just outside of their, of their flat. So very due to, and then the conversation went right back into Hindi and Tamal Krishna and Radha Raman dutifully picked up Krishna, took him out to the van and came back empty handed. And then, th and during this conversation of, of uh, Hindi, Prabhupada broke out into English again and, and said, thank you to those boys. And then it went back into Hindi. And while it was in Hindi, Prabhupada said something that made everybody who was listening in, in to him speak Hindi laugh. And the, the conversation suddenly uh, stopped its, its uh, sort of sober tone and became jovial. And the people that were seemingly resisting giving us the, the deities had forgotten all about that and they were just listening to the, the very humorous stuff that Prabhupada was saying. So then it, can, then it went back into Hindi, uh, it resumed in Hindi and uh, it was all kind of jovial. And then and the next thing I remember is that we were in the van with the deities driving off and after we got fairly far away from, from the flat, Prabhupada began to say, well, the, the bank manager when I was in India, when I was in Bengal some years ago, had a scheme, but I foiled his scheme. What I, what I deduced later on that meant was that Prabhupada had applied for a loan and that the, the bank manager wasn't going to give it to him. But Prabhupada eventually talked him into it, got, changed his mind. So what Prabhupada told us was he said, I foiled the bank manager's scheme in Bengal. And, th and then the bank manager said to me, he said, Mr. Day, you should have been a politician and Prabhupada chuckled. And then years later we realized about the whole, the whole thing, what, what actually had probably happened. I got a bit curious about what is a, a Nitya Siddha and what's a Nitya Bada, uh, a conditioned, eternally conditioned and et eternally liberated soul. So I wrote a letter to Prabhupada asking him what, what is the meaning of these different types of Siddhas or perfectionists, perfectional people. And so he wrote to me back that there's three, mainly three different types of siddhas. The Kripana siddhas, the siddhas that are perfect by mercy, the uh, Nitya siddhas that eternally are liberated, and the Sadhana siddhas, the, the, the people who become perfect by, by practice. So he said these are the three main different types of siddhas. But in another sense, they're all the same, they're all equal. And the, the, the way they're all equal is like many different rivers flow into the ocean but once the water reaches the ocean, we don't try to determine whether it came from the Amazon, the Mississippi, the Missouri, or whatever. They're all equal. So even though this, there's officially three different types of sitas, once a person is a perfectional person, it doesn't matter whether he got there through sadhana, through kripa, or through or, or his anitya. It really doesn't matter. So that was the answer that Prabhupada gave. And it was kind of satisfactory to me because I realized that, that even I could become a sita. Which, is what I, which was kind of one of the reasons behind my asking that question. In, in approximately April of 1970, uh, the London Temple was very seriously in debt to the BBT to the tune of about sixty or seventy thousand dollars. I was the temple president and Prabhupada was very concerned and so he called me in to ask me how we intended to uh, to uh, uh, eradicate this debt. And I, I didn't know the answer. And he said, how many Indian people live in, in this country? And I said, oh, maybe 400, 500,000. He said, so if everyone pays one pound every day, will, will that eradicate the debt? And then I very um, privately calculated how that would work. And I said, well, yes, it would. He said, so. And then, and then we went around the, uh, I went with another devotee to, to, uh, to Hindu houses for almost a year getting what we called standing orders where they agreed to pay so much a month for so many years and uh, gradually we, we uh, got that debt back down to zero through the standing orders and through other means.
because we knew that Prabhupada himself didn't want us to be in debt forever, especially to the BBT, which was his very heart and soul. The only time I was with Prabhupada and George Harrison was when uh, Prabhupada uh, uh, recited to him a, ver a translation of a verse that, that uh, I think it was Rupa Goswami who said that, or Sanatan Goswami who said that, I, that I, I only have two ears and one tongue and I wish that I had millions of ears and millions of tongues so I could better relish the, uh, the chanting of the Hare Krishna mantra. And I remember George Harrison saying he liked that verse and Prabhupada asking Prajumna to give him a cassette copy of, of that verse in, in English and in, in whatever language it was. There seemed to be a, a very strong relationship between Prabhupada and, and, and George Harrison. And, and what happened one day was when George came, Prabhupada was, was uh, resting, it was an afternoon time, and he uh, awoke to, to meet with George and, and he said that this sleeping is a, a very bad habit. He said, it's just a waste of time, I don't like to do it. And George appreciated that. I was there at that time when, when Prabhupada rose from his uh, sleep and, and, and came to meet George. The characteristic of Prabhupada that stands out the most for me was probably his humility and his affection. He was like a, a father and a grandfather to me. So that, that above all the other qualities, saintly qualities that he had, uh, and still has, probably were, were the, the ones that were most meaningful to me. Yeah.